see you. Man, it is awesome to be in this place with you. Uh, I have a number of things for us before we get going. Uh, I just kind of want to just sit in time of worship, right? Uh, it's sweet to have a place to call home. Um, it is sweet to not only just call a place uh, home, but it's the people within this home that make it home, right? Um, and so I got a text message this morning. I know some of you have been like anticipating when I would send something out or text you, but um, EJ and Courtney have welcomed baby boy on Friday. Yeah. Um, it's like 1.45-ish. I don't know the exact time, and I'm not going to look, but around 1.45-ish on Friday, they welcome Perry Reed Hymans. Um, and so... Baby uh, Perry is here, and they're doing well. EJ uh, texted me this morning and said, everyone's healthy, everyone's well. They may go home today. Um, I told him, just stay. Just stay here now. I didn't tell him that, but that's what we're all saying, though, right? <laughs> just stay. They take care of the baby for a little bit. Um, but, uh, yeah, they're doing well. So um, uh, I did get some photos, so maybe I'll send out a, an email that will have some photos. Um, EJ did mention this, speaking of home, um, he says, uh, love you bro, tell everyone, it takes a village. Um, and so, EJ, Courtney, and Perry uh, know that it takes a village, and we are that village for them. Um, and so whenever they get back home, I know we'll all get an opportunity in one way or another to love on them as their village. Um, but uh, just be prayerful for them in the meantime, um, that all uh, remains well, um, especially as they get home. Pray for their family, too. I know this is a big celebration for both sides of their family. So, uh, very cool. It's really weird. Uh, him and I were talking about this yesterday. Um, it, it makes me feel, and I know, I mean, I just turned 40 in August. So I'm really not that old, because some of you are really old. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, you can email me later, bobby at abc09-210-6018. Anyway, no, I meant you, I met EJ, Hannah and I met EJ when he was a sophomore in high school. Um, so this is just awesome and wild and crazy at the same time to think that kid who walked into that visitor's locker room for lunch as a sophomore now has a son. It's crazy. Um, yeah, it's just weird. Um, we're in this study through the book of John, so if you have a Bible, if you're going to have your mobile device open, John chapter 14 is where we're going to be. There's a Bible in the pocket in front of you. Uh, feel free to open that, um, take that, steal that, make it a gift. And there's some Bibles up in the front. Um, I, will, I will say this. Um, I haven't made this announcement in a while, so I'm just going to make it again. You need to have the Bible open during the week. Sitting here on Sundays is not enough for us to have our Bibles open, only in this moment. And relying only on this 35, 40 minutes. And that's it. So take a Bible. There's Bibles in the front, uh, front room. Take one. There's even this really cool, I think there's only one up there, but there's this Bible that's up there. It's just beautifully illustrated. Um, our family has taken and reading that every single night, one story at a time. There's one up there. The, I, I'll start praying here at the end, and you just race out there and take it before anyone else does. I, I just don't hurt um, But we must have our Bibles open um, in, 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 throughout the week and reading it to ourselves and reading it to those around us. Um, John chapter 14, next week will be in John chapter 15. And it's also our fifth Sunday, fifth, not ten. Fifth Sunday means that we call it family worship. So we don't send the kids down. Um, unless you really want to get rid of your kids, we'll send them down. We don't send kids down. Babies can go down. Babies can stay. Um, but it's family worship. There's something about the family unit in this building together for this time. Singing praise and going through God's word together. Um, and so we, um, that's the fifth Sunday. Every, uh, the, the Sundays that have the weeks, the months that have five Sundays is family uh, worship. And so that happens to be next week. You also may notice in the front lawn um, that there'll be pinwheels. Um, this week, we're going to put them out on uh, uh, tomorrow, on Monday. Um, uh, April is what they call um, oh, I'm just that name. Almost not here. Uh, 
It's, uh, it's, it's for uh, children. Oh, there you are. Um, what do they call April? Is it Child Abuse Prevention Month? That's what it is. Um, and so you see a lot of blue uh, around town. Downtown is lit up in blue. The smokestacks at the quarry. This coming Sunday is also intentionally uh, marked as Blue Sunday, which helps to promote and advocate awareness for this effort. Um, and so we did this last year. We just had a special time of prayer. Uh, but the pinwheels in the front will um, give awareness to uh, that there is a lot of uh, children in the state of Texas who are in the foster system uh, because of abuse that they uh, were a part of within their family system that uh, they were taken out. Um, so we're going to put that in the front just as a, uh, an awareness. Um, also, we'll have a special time in our service next Sunday to be praying for um, we did get a note from CPS, and we may have some families here um, that are um, in all sorts of that type of uh, situation within their homes. I don't know who they will be, um, but I know that we may have some guests. And so we just want to be sensitive to coming alongside the families and equipping them to be um, solid families um, and making sure moms and dads have what they need for their kids. Uh, but we also want to advocate for those kids who have, um, it's not by their choice that they're in the situation that they're in, um, to celebrate the foster system, the adoption system, but also to come along and champion those kids, knowing that they have a Father God who loves them. Um, and so um, that's what the pinwheels will be out there for, and that's what Sunday uh, we'll have a time for that. Um, and lately we'll be preaching from John chapter 15. John chapter 14 today. Now let me mention this before we jump in. I mentioned this last week. I'm going to say it again here, and I know Layton will probably mention it next Sunday. The events that take place in John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 all happen, are recorded by John for us to see, to read, to experience, to study, to meditate on. All happen within 24 hours of Jesus being crucified, killed, put into a tomb, and then rising again. So before all that happens, this 24-hour period, John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, that makes it significant that we slow down and take time to go through these passages. But it does us no good if we just have Hazardly study, read, and go through them. We need to sit in the wake of the moment, being that Jesus knows what's about to happen and his disciples and followers don't. Now we know because we have sometime or another gone through these passages. We, we know the end of the story, right? We've been in church long enough to know what is about to happen. But we must put ourselves in this context that we might feel the gravity, the weight, the importance, the significance of what's happening. It will help us to read differently, study differently, experience differently. I also want to point out for us to remember um, verse 1 of chapter 13 where um, Jesus says, I love my followers until the end. Like, we sat in that moment last week, and that's kind of the posture as we kind of continue on the rest of the book of John. And then we see the overwhelming, so wild, crazy, not comprehend, like we can't com com comprehend it at times, the amount of love that Jesus has for his followers. Until the very end. We also looked on Wednesday that um, Jesus had compassion for the people that he encountered from town to town, city to city, uh, from temple to temple, synagogue to synagogue. The, the people that Jesus encountered, he had overwhelming compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. They were lost, broken, in darkness, without a shepherd. And Jesus came to be that shepherd for them and for us until the end. 
So, John chapter 14. Here we go. You ready? Yes. Good. Thank you. John chapter 14. And for the four of you that are ready. Yeah. <laughs> John chapter 14, verse 1 says this. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. I'm going to read it one time. Then I'll ask a question. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Do you believe? Do we believe? It's Jesus' fault that their hearts are troubled in this moment. Can we say that honestly in this, like this morning, like without getting struck by the lightning that was all over the place? This is why it's Jesus' fault. Three things. Um, one of you, he mentions in the chapter before, in the moment before in the upper room, one of you will betray me. And remember, the, the, the conversation that the disciples are having in the upper room is, um, where do you think you stand in the hierarchy behind Jesus, right? Like, Jesus is an important figure the disciples have come to believe, the twelve, and maybe even other followers. And so there was this jostling for position. If Jesus is king, if Jesus is Messiah, Savior, going to take over Rome, um, I wonder where I fall in this hierarchy. And it's in that moment that Jesus enters and says, hey, one of you is going to betray me. And so then it shifts. I wonder if it's you or you or you, right? Of course their hearts are troubled. Who is it that's going to betray? And then he says this. Um, before all this is over, all of you will scatter because you're afraid and you're scared and you're going to deny me. So one's going to betray, all of you will scatter in fear and you're going to deny me. And if that's not enough, Jesus, who spent a three year period um, having these men follow him so closely, having the crowds healed and taught in awe, they too followed and made their way to wherever Jesus was. And then Jesus says, and by the way, I'm leaving. And I don't know what you've conjured up as far as me as your Messiah, but I've got to go. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Freaking out here, right? I, I've been, I wrote this down on Monday, and it's been like just stirring within my heart all week. And I, I sent it out this morning in an email, and it's up on the front screen when you walk in. Well, it's a public service announcement for us. Did you know? That you and I can have, live in, experience a troubled life. Yet, you and I can have hearts that are not troubled. Did you know that? Like, I don't need to tell you or remind you how troubling life can be. Because it is. We've experienced, we're currently in it, or it's come. But what I want us to really see, feel, know, trust, and hope in as we go through John chapter 14, is that while that might be the case, life troubled me, that we don't have to have hearts that are troubled. That our hearts could be fixed on something other than the troubles of this world. And that's what we see here in this moment. By Jesus saying, hey, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust in me. Or maybe he said this way. Don't you trust in God? Don't you trust in me? So what do we do with this? Because we probably also, if you're like me, have family members, friends, sons, daughters, 
aunts, uncles, parents, grandparents, who would we, out of love, share texts like this? Don't let your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust in Jesus. Are still flabbergasted to understand. You have no clue what I'm sitting in. You have no clue who I am. You have no clue what I've experienced. Right? Jesus, I believe, shares three things in this passage as we continue. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Look at uh, uh, verse 2. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you that I, I am going there to prepare a place for you. Verse 3 says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. And I will take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know, verse 4, you know the way to the place where I'm going. Jesus speaks to our troubled hearts in these three ways. Number one, trust and believe in God and trust and believe in me. Jesus leans into his closest friends and he leans into us and he says, the answer isn't a checklist. Some of you are really good at checklists. As a matter of fact, um, our mobile devices have this really cool, we have an iPhone, um, which some of you don't, and when I text you it's green, and that's frustrating sometimes. <laughs> but on the notes application of our iPhones, you can share a note with somebody else and somebody in my household, I won't tell you who, always sends me those notes with those little bubbles I'm supposed to check whether I get them done or not. <laughs> Jesus in this moment doesn't, don't tell him I said that. <laughs> Jesus in this moment doesn't send us a checklist. Jesus in this moment says, I want you to be in relationship with I want you to trust me because you know me. And the reason you know me is because we're in a relationship. We're going to see that that matters because Jesus is going to make an even more profound statement in just a bit. A statement that the world that we live in condemns us for. Hates us for. But before we get there, we must understand that Jesus is not giving us a checklist, a thing to do, but rather he wants us to be in relationship with him. And it's by saying, yes, I believe you. Yes, I trust you. Yes, I hope in you. Yes, I am yours. Number one, trust and believe. In God and trust and believe in Jesus. The, the second thing that he does is um, we've got a place to stay. Isn't it reassuring to know that you have a place to go home to? We've said that already earlier in the service. Uh, we have a place to stay. Jesus makes mention, starting in verse 2, my father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, wouldn't I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? We have a place to stay because he's preparing it for us. Um, so just a quick translation here. Um, if you're reading out of the King James or the New King James, um, it says what in this verse? Mansions. I've got a mansion for you. And we get, we get excited. Right? Nobody? No? Okay. We've got a tiny home for you. Maybe you get more excited for that. It's in right now. Right? Um, so, uh, mansions, a big house, sometimes translate. There's even a song. Big, big house with. Nobody knows that song? Oh my goodness, we got a culture in this place. Yeah, man. Mansions, big house. Some of your translations say a dwelling place, right? A place to stay. I don't know the square footage of what Jesus is preparing for us right now. And I don't think it matters. But there is a word in here that I think matters that we must know. First, 
trust, believe in God. Trust, believe in Jesus. Number two, we've got a place to stay. And it doesn't matter the size, but this is the word, the key word that matters. My father's house has many, underlined circle, square, highlight, many. How many is many? Many. Which is a lot. And I, I think that matters for us. And this is why. How many people are in our city, state, country, world? Many. I, I, you can count them. I'm not going to count them. I'll, I'll trust you. Millions, billions of people. First, um, 
it's interesting, I put on the sign, we don't know where you're going. I, there's this tension, maybe, on Broadway, as, as people drive past that. How dare that church? Judging me because they're telling me as I drive by, you're going to hell. That's how you can read the sign, isn't it? Like, we don't know where you driving on Broadway are going. And we're judging you as you drive by and not coming in. It could be read that way. And I didn't put up it, I didn't put that message up there for that way. But I kind of chuckled this week as I passed by thinking, shame on that church. <laughs> But isn't that our cry of our heart at times? I have no clue where I'm at. I have no clue who you are, Jesus. I have no clue where you're at. In what I'm facing. In who I am. Who I'm trying to figure out I am. I don't know the way is the lament in our hearts at times, isn't it? If we were honest enough to submit to that lamenting We don't know the way. There's a guy in the Bible that gets a bad rap, right? Verse 4 says, you know the way to the place where I'm going. And then verse 5, what's his name? Starts with the T and the Thomas. Thomas, right? Thomas gets a bad rap because, so he, he says this in verse 5. Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Uh, let's, let's take a quick uh, rabbit trail, if you will. Um, it, you don't have to turn there. You can take note of this. But um, um, John chapter 11, verse 14 to 16. You know, I'm going to go backwards. I'm going to go backwards because I think that would be more appropriate. John chapter 20, verse 26 says this. Um, a week later, so this is a week after Jesus rises from the dead. A week later, his disciples were in a house again, and Thomas was with them. Because, uh, just a, a brief moment before this, Thomas wasn't there. Don't know where he was, he wasn't there. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. Uh, other uh, gospel writers say Jesus went through the wall. Right? Jesus stands there with them and says, Peace be with you. And verse 27 says, Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out and put it in the side, into my side. Stop doubting and believe. A moment before when they told Thomas, Jesus is alive, Thomas said, No, no, no. I have to put my finger in his wounds, like in his hands and in his side, and then I'll believe. It's because of that Thomas gets a bad rap, right? Verse 11, or chapter 11, when uh, uh, Lazarus dies, Jesus is with them, they're not in Bethany yet, Jesus says to um, his disciples in chapter 11, verse 14, so then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I'm glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let's go to him. Thomas, in verse 16, also known as Didymus, your translation might say, uh, also known as the twin, Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, let us all go that we may die with him. Now because of the first passage I read, we read this response with the same doubt, with the same like type of attitude almost that Thomas says, let's go so that we may die also. That's not how Thomas says this. We just, because we think we're smart people, read it with that type of attitude for Thomas because he gets the name of Doubting Thomas. How would you like it if you walked around with your sin that you struggle with the most in one moment, and that's how you are known for the rest of your life. It'd be 
pretty bleak of a life, right? So it's because of that that we, but Thomas is actually saying, we don't know how Lazarus died, but we're with you, Jesus. We're with Lazarus. Let's go too so that we may die. He's not doubting in this moment yet. Doubt creeps in, doesn't it? It did for Thomas. It did for the other disciples. And doubt creeps into our own lives, right? Like maybe even as the rain moved in today, my alarm went off at 4.57, sitting there with a cup of coffee, brilliantly just enjoying it, and then it came. And it was still pretty brilliant. My power went out. Okay, it's five in the morning, you don't need power anyway. Doubt creeps in in the same way. Um, I read this quote this week by Tim Keller. If you've been with me for the last three weeks, I've won this Tim Keller kick that I can't get off of. Tim Keller says this. Um, it's a bit of a long quote, so, so just track with me, just hang with me. Okay, is that okay? Yeah? Okay, here it goes. A faith without some doubt is like a human body without antibodies in it. People who go through life too busy or indifferent to ask hard questions about why they believe as they do will find themselves defenseless against either the experience or tragedy or the probing question of a smart skeptic. A person's faith can collapse almost overnight if he or she has failed over the years to listen patiently to his or her own, his or, his or her own doubts, which should only be discarded after long reflection. Believers should acknowledge and wrestle with doubt. Not only their own, but their friends and neighbors. It is no longer sufficient to hold beliefs just because you inherited them. Only if you struggle long and hard with objections to your faith will you be able to provide the grounds for your beliefs to skeptics, including yourself. And just as important from our current situation, such a process will lead you, even after you come to a position of strong faith, to respect and understand those who doubt around you. It is okay to doubt and question. May we have permission to doubt and question. The more important question is where are we seeking answers when we doubt and question? Who, where, what are we turning to in those moments is what matters most. So uh, doubt, question, ask, but turn to God's word. And more importantly, if you hear anything, turn to God's word when doubting, questioning, searching, with people who are around you. Don't do it alone. That's where doubting, questioning, becoming a skeptic gets ourselves in trouble, right? Because we do it by ourselves and we turn elsewhere. We turn our backs away. Um, Believe, trust in God. Believe, trust in Jesus. Know that we have home. And when we turn our back away from those first two, is where we find ourselves in a lot of trouble. Doubt, question, ask, seek. Hear this. Doubt, question, ask, seek. Because we know the way. Right? Thomas in verse 5 
says, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And then in verse 6, highlight, circle, square, underline. Friends, rip out of your Bibles and keep it with you this week. Jesus answers, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except me. Verse 7 says, if you really know me, you will know my Father as well. Which is a bookend to number one. Don't let your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Here's the bookend. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen me. Friends, we know the way. This is where we find ourselves in trouble in the world that we live in, right? How narrow-minded, how small-minded you people are. There's only one way. I, I could give you, just as there are many rooms, I could give you many ways, right? Yet we uh, stand closely together gripping tightly and not letting go of the one way, the one truth, the one life. It's Jesus, the way to the Father. Now I say it often this way in this building. At just the right time, God loved you, God loved me, this whole world Full of many people that at just the right time he sent his son Jesus to be the way, the truth, and the life. That we would, like his death on the cross, put to death our worry, our doubt, our fears, our anxieties, our, our brokenness, our hurt, our pain, our guilt. And like his resurrection, be ourselves brought back to life. That we would live a life, as was mentioned earlier, live a life that walks through experiences, sees trouble. Yet we live with a heart that beats without doubt because of the way truth and the life. If that doesn't excite us to get out of this building, then something is wrong inside of us. Something is broken inside of us. And so would we submit that brokenness to him today? That we would be forever changed Living a life that matters. Because He, the way, the truth, and the life matters. And would it make an impact in our households? Ooh, because of the relationship that we have with our Savior Jesus, it changes the relationships that we have with the people around us, with the many. Jesus in this moment, in this 24 hour period before his arrest and death and burial and resurrection, he, he, he says, Listen, I, I need you to know that you don't need temples anymore, that you don't need the synagogue, you don't need the law, you don't need sacrifices, you need me. The way, the truth, and the life. And hold on tight because there will be trouble. But I'm here. So believe in and trust in. Know that I'm making a place, a home for you. And you know the way because I am the way. Would you pray with me, Father God?
desires of our hearts, or at least the desire of my heart this morning, is that everyone's heart in this room would be so moved, stirred, to know you, the way, the truth, and the life. That all of us in this room would do whatever it takes to make ourselves near you, Jesus. Because you are the way, the truth, and the life. And when we do whatever it takes to leave here with an energy, with an urgency, with an excitement to tell the many that we encounter, that we know the way, the truth, and the life, and that they too can know. Protect us. Provide. Forgive us. And lead us. Thank you for the families that are here, uh, for this place that we can call a home as a church family. God, as we face life this week, we trust in, we believe in you. That you have begun a good work and that you would be faithful to complete it in us and through us for your sake, Jesus. And so we thank you for this time. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So awesome to see you today. Have a great week. Uh, come hang out with us Wednesday, dinner at 6, study at 6.30. If not, see you soon. Bye.